Hello and welcome to The Pier. Welcome to our online service for the week of November the 12th. It's great to be together like this. And I hope you've had a great week. If you're new, my name is Jason and I'm the lead pastor here at The Pier. And just prior to this, you've seen some slides that were talking about how you can connect with us, how you can partner with us financially, and even some of the things that are going on. If you have any questions about any of those, please don't hesitate to contact us. You can always email us at info at the pier dot church. And there's some things going on later in November, early December that you want to pay uh, particular attention to, especially our greenery workshop and our healthy essentials campaign. Well, today we are into week five of our series called Real Motivation. We've been talking a lot about that very theme, especially around the themes of encouraging one another, building each other up. And today we're going to talk about maybe a subject that's a little bit difficult to talk about, but one that is really powerful and one that I hope we'll see just is a needed conversation to have, and that's on accountability. But before we move into that, I'd love to take the moment just to pray together now. And in fact, if you'd like to have an extended time of prayer, feel free to press pause now. But let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this time together. We pray that you'd bless it. Holy Spirit, we invite you to move. We invite you to teach us and guide us. And, and we pray that each word that's spoken you would use to help us to be more and more like you, Jesus, and to draw us closer to you, Jesus. And so again, we just give this time to you. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as I said, we're into week five in our series, and today we're talking about accountability. In fact, we're going to take two weeks to talk about this. I think it's a really important subject. And when you hear that word, accountability, I wonder how it makes you feel. I wonder how you kind of have related to it in the past. Maybe you've seen accountability in healthy ways. Maybe you've seen it play out in really negative ways. Well, what I want to talk about today is accountability from the community perspective. And then next week, we're going to talk about it more on the personal individual front. I want to talk about how the need is there so much for there to be healthy accountability in place for Christian communities, for local church communities. Maybe this is something that's more towards the obvious. Because here's the thing, in, in the news, in our culture in our day, we see the need for accountability all the time, especially when it comes to major corporations, right? How many scandals have come to surface because companies have finally been held accountable and because they weren't holding themselves accountable, right? They thought that they could cheat the system. The thing is, when the stakes are high, it seems almost inevitable that people will try to find ways to cut corners, try to find ways to make a buck, to save a buck. And you know what? I learned recently about this example, the example of Volkswagen. This happened in 2015, and it's been called Dieselgate or Emissions Gate. And actually, it was around just that, around on, uh, the subject of car emissions. We all know that we want our cars to be better and better for the environment. And so thankfully, there is accountability in place. There's emissions test where cars have to pass a certain test so that they can pro be proved to be within the safe guidelines. And so when you buy a car, you're assuming that it's passing those tests. Well, Volkswagen got into hot water around this. Like I said, in 2015, they have, they're very famous for their diesel-run cars, right? And if you can buy a diesel car that is good for the environment, that's passing the emission sets, that's a really good thing because diesel, it's really good mileage. Well, they had been passing the tests, but it turns out they were cheating. <laughs> it turns out that they had put in a piece of software in their cars that actually the software, it would 
make sure to control things so that the amount of nitrogen would be below the acceptable level. And then when the test was not going on any longer, it would go back to normal. Well, they were finally caught in the act. They were finally um, caught. And this was just a detrimental discovery for Volkswagen. And it turned out there was around estimated around 11 million cars that had this cheater software in it. And so the fines that they received were in the billions and a lot of trust was lost on the part of Volkswagen. So there's just an example and there's so many others, right, of how we need to hold corporations accountable and they need to hold themselves accountable. There needs to be a proper structure in place so that they don't go where they know they shouldn't go so that they can become healthy companies. And you know what? The same is true about Christian communities and especially about local church communities. And that's what I want to talk about today. We're going to talk about how accountability is part of Christianity. And that's a good thing, especially when it comes to church communities because it helps create healthy church communities. So that's what we're going to explore today. And I want to start out by asking this question. Why is it that accountability is so important to Christianity and to church communities? Well, it turns out, when you think about it, that to be a Christian just automatically involves accountability. Because what does being a Christian mean? We've talked about this before. It means that you're a follower of Jesus, right? At its very basic, you are a follower of Jesus. In other words, you're a disciple of Jesus. And if you're a disciple, then there is accountability in place. And you know what? That idea of discipleship, it wasn't something new in Jesus' day. It was a really common thing. Jesus took a, an already existing practice and made it more widespread. Because in Jesus' day, it was known that the kind of the brightest young Jewish boys would be partnered up with a rabbi. And, and that rabbi would kind of be their coach for life. Especially they would follow that rabbi in the way of emulating how he lived and, and they would learn from him the ways of Torah, the ways of the law, how to live well according to the law. And obviously in that was accountability because the rabbi would be the one to guide them and the one to correct them when they made mistakes. No questions asked. It's not that unlike our modern day apprenticeships. So that's the idea here. To be a disciple of Jesus meant you are held responsible. You're held responsible for your action and you're accountable to Jesus. So th that's the reality. And that's why Jesus says to us, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. To be a disciple is to follow Jesus. And so Paul says in Romans 14, that yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. That's Romans 14. I like how he puts it here. He's reminding us, yes, as disciples of Jesus, we are accountable. We're accountable to God. And here's where he takes it, right? He says, so then live in such a way where you're building each other up, you're strengthening each other, you're helping each other out. That's what God wants to see. So accountability, it's part of Christianity. And it's part of then Christian communities. There needs to be a healthy, what we might call accountability st structure in place. And this isn't something that I think we talk about very often and might even be a confusing subject. You might think, well, how does that work in a church community? So I want to talk about that just a little bit right now, what we learn from Scripture in terms of what should be in place in a local church. We want to talk about who is accountable to who in this situation. Paul's already said we're all accountable to God, but then when it comes to the local church, there is a structure in place that the New Testament talks about. It's kind of a theme in the New Testament how that God has called leaders and, and pastors and, uh, to kind of guide and, and lead and protect 
churches and church communities and God's people. It's this analogy that, that God calls shepherds, you know, to do what good shepherds do, to protect, to guide, and even correct. And so there's people that are gifted, that are called to this. And Hebrews says this about spiritual leaders. It says, obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls, and they are accountable to God. So give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. So a church community then is accountable to their leadership. And okay, let's be honest, because even as we read that, I'm sure it might make you a little nervous if you're like me, actually, because here's the thing. You could probably call to mind, maybe you've been experienced yourself where you've seen this abused. You've seen this used as kind of a weapon in a church community. And that is certainly not what this is talking about. This is talking about something healthy. This is talk about, talking about something that really is in the ways of Christ. Because we can't forget that Jesus said those who would lead would serve. And so the leaders that God has put in place and the pastor, pastoral team that God has put in place is there to serve, to self, like selflessly and sacrificially serve the community, trying to bring out the best in that community. And so it's in that spirit that this is true. And so it's meant to be on the basis of trust. And then... In turn, though, that's the other side of this. It, it, maybe it's abused sometimes because it's taken as that, you know, pastors are kind of above being held accountable, but that is certainly not true at all because in turn, the Bible's clear that the leaders of churches are in turn to be held accountable. There's supposed to be accountability structure in place for them as well. First off, you saw in that passage in Hebrews that it says that that pastors and spiritual leaders are held accountable to God. And Jesus says this. He says, when someone has been given much, much will be required in turn. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. There is a greater degree of responsibility on the shoulder of spiritual leaders because of the kind of the position of trust that they are in. So they are indeed held accountable to a pretty high standard by God. They're accountable to God. But here's the thing. We can't take that to mean that leaders are just on their own then and somehow independent and that they don't have to answer to other people. That is certainly not what we see in the New Testament. In the early church, it was team, sorry, lead teams, uh, teams of leaders. Uh, think about it, right? The main leaders of the church, the apostles, there was more than one, right? And also, when we read about in the book of Acts, when important decisions were being made, it was by a council, by the Jerusalem council. And whenever we see local church leadership talked about, it's teams of leaders in place. So there's the sense in which leads are responsible to each other. They're held accountable by each other. And also, very much so, I strongly believe in the importance of there being an, account, an overarching accountability as well. It's, it's why pastors need to be held accountable to, say, a church board, and also why I think it's really healthy for pastors to be credentialed with a healthy denomination. So that way they're held accountable to that denomination as well. So leaders and pastors are accountable to their leadership and to God. But at the end of the day, Jesus teaches that we are all accountable to one another in any church community. The, he clearly teaches this. It's a really good accountability structure in Matthew 18. And he talks about what you should do if someone hurts you, if someone does something to harm you in your community. He says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, Take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. 
You see in this that to be part of a community means that you're agreeing to be held accountable, taking responsibility. And here, what Jesus is doing is empowering communities and empowering each of us to hold each other accountable. And he gives us this really healthy way of doing it, this really healthy method of doing it. So that's a little bit on what accountability looks like in a local church community. And lastly, I want to talk about the why of all of this. Like, what does all of this accomplish? And I want to talk about how I believe it creates a healthy culture, which is something that we really want to strive for. First off, lack of accountability in communities, it harms them. It leads communities downhill. It's much like the corporate scandals in the news. We're seeing too many churches that have not had this accountability in place and they've succumbed to cheating, to just cutting corners or treating people terribly in the name of trying to grow or any things like that. And we've got actually a really great example in the Old Testament of this in the kingdom of Israel. It involves Solomon. So I'm sure you've heard of Solomon before. He's known as possibly the wisest man that ever walked the earth next to Jesus. And he was the one, the king who brought Israel into a time of peace and prosperity. But it turns out he was a bit of a slave driver. He had some amazing building projects and it sounds like he built those on the backs of his people, really driving them harshly. And we find this out after his death, actually. He had the power to do this, obviously. As the king of Israel, the accountability wasn't in place, and he was able to be harsh with his people. And as I said, we find this out after he dies with this, with this scene involving his son, Rehoboam. Rehoboam is to be the one who becomes king in Solomon's place. And the people take this as an opportunity to try to change things. The assembly of the people approaches Rehoboam and they say to him, please don't be like your dad. Basically, here's what they say. Lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke your dad put on us and we will serve you. And even Rehoboam's elders, his elder council, they say, yes, you should listen to the people. But Rehoboam, he must have thought that he was untouchable, that he could do whatever he wanted because he didn't listen. Actually, he listens to basically a group of his friends. And here's how he responds to them. He says, basically, you think my dad was bad? I'm going to be even worse. He says that my father laid on you a heavy yoke. Well, I will make it a heavier yoke. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. As I said, he thought he was untouchable. He was being a tough guy here. He says, I'm not changing a thing. In fact, it's going to be worse. And what happens? Well, basically the whole kingdom rebels. And actually, the majority of the kingdom splits off and forms its own kingdom. The kingdom of Israel in the north, all that's left is this little tribe in the south, which is Judah, which is called Judah, and it, that's where Jerusalem is. So the kingdom splits, and there's almost a deadly civil war. So if Solomon and then his son had held themselves accountable and, then, and listened to the accountability of others, it could have prevented the split of a kingdom. So it just goes to show that there needs to be that in place. And this was a live example of this proverb. For lack of guidance, a nation falls. You could put it, for lack of accountability, a nation falls. But victory is won through many advisors. When we listen to each other, victory is won. So that's the negative. That's the reason why accountability needs to be there to prevent us from going where we don't want to go. But also, account when accountability is present, a healthy culture can be created. And that is something that we are striving for. Because when it comes to our peer community, 
we've talked a lot about kind of the, the culture we want to create. We could put it that way. We've talked about how we want to we create a culture here by the power of the Holy Spirit, a culture that is truly safe, you know, truly safe for people to explore their faith, to be themselves, to be loved for who they are, to explore their faith at the pace the Holy Spirit has for them. And we also want to be a culture that is discipleship focused and open to all generations. And that takes accountability. So what are we talking about when we start talking about culture? This is a word we use all the time. We know that we are in a culture. We are surrounded by it. Maybe you haven't thought about the fact that churches have a culture too. But what is a culture? Well, I've mentioned it before. Scott McKnight and Laura Berenger have written a great book called A Church Called Tove, and it's all about church culture. And they say that culture, when you boil it down, it socializes us into what is considered proper behavior. You think about where did I get my moral compass from? Where did I get my moral tuition, intuitions? You know, the things that I just feel like, oh, I can't do that, or oh, I've got to do that. To some extent, those are culturally conditioned, either by our general culture or by our church community. Think of how that's how we feel this need to say sorry all the time when we, when, we cut some, when we get in someone's way or, you know, even if it's not our fault. Like, where did that come from? That's culturally conditioned, right? And here's the thing. Even if you reject your culture, it's still influencing you. So it's basically, it's unescapable, inescapable, and it's just a fact of life. When people get together, they create a culture. And the same is true of local churches. Local churches have a culture that the people have created as well. It's people have created. And Scott McKnight and Laura Berenger say this, what people experience in contact with your church, its services, its leaders, its people, its program, you know, the kind of vibe that your community gives off, that is your church's culture. And you think about being a new person in a, a new church. And it's especially um, poignant. You can really sense them because you're not in it yet. And so churches have all different kinds of cultures, right? I've just given some pictures here for you to imagine the different cultures that would be in these different settings. You've got churches that are very militant, very structured, very rigid in how they do things and how they do their services. Or, or you've got churches that are very chaotic, maybe. There's a real lack of structure. I remember going to a particular charismatic church once that was, it just felt that way. Like the worship service had people running around, grabbing flags, dancing, people were crying, people were singing loudly, and there wasn't rows. It was kind of people everywhere. It just felt really chaotic. And the ch culture too, like to kind of go off of this one, I'm sure you can recognize that. Some churches can give off this kind of like, we're putting on a big show. And usually with that, there's like a celebrity culture where the, the pastor or the leadership and the worship team and all of that, they're, they're kind of treated like celebrities. And it's almost as if the church is there to serve them. And it can be toward the negative as well, right? I grew up in a church that had a healthy culture for a time, but it shifted to the type of culture where, you know, there was like this small group of people that they wanted the power and, and they got it through kind of, fear tactics and backbiting and all of that. And, and so gradually the culture shifted to a fear-based one where it was, okay, we got to do what they say or else, you know? And, and the pastor wasn't part of it actually. So when the pastor went against it, the pastor had to go. So you know what I mean now that local churches, we can have our own culture. And that's important to recognize. I, I think it's really important to think of things in those terms. Because when we realize that, then we realize we want our culture to be a healthy one. We want our culture to be a safe one, a discipleship-focused one, one that is open to all generations. And when we realize how much we need and want that, then we realize the need for accountability because we only get to a healthy culture through holding each other accountable because we're all responsible for the culture we create. We're not going to get into detail with this, but this provides just a healthy, or sorry, a helpful um, look at how culture is created. And it just goes to show how everyone's involved. Because yes, sure, leadership has a 
a major influence on the culture and in a lot of ways for getting it all started in the first place. Because culture kind of has this thing where first, you know, it's taught and then people practice it and then they start to pass it on. That's what Scott McKnight and Laura Beringer, Laura Beringer say. And it's always changing then. And we all help to create it. And like I said, it, it often starts with the leadership. And it starts by the leadership trying to articulate what our vision is, where we're headed. And, and ideally, <laughs> they are acting that out. They're modeling it for others. And they're teaching on it regularly. And they're even maybe building policies to reinforce it. And that is passed on to everyone. And if people like it <laughs> and get behind it, then they start to you know, live it out and embody it and then pass it on, right? Reteaching it to others and reshaping it. So everyone is involved in this. And in fact, in that way, congregations can actually end up influencing the leaders quite a lot too. As the culture starts to really get set in place, it really starts to influence everyone actually. Because as Scott McKnight and Laura Beringer say, Laura Beringer say that when over time, if culture gets strong enough, it almost becomes like this independent entity or agent that has a lot of power and influence over everyone else. It, it creates like this top-down pressure over everyone. It's this pressure that says, we don't do these sorts of things. We do these sorts of things. We think in this sort of way. We don't think that way. This is what we value. This is what we don't value. And once it's in place, it's really hard to change. It takes quite a while to change. So, like I said, but we all play a role. So we are all accountable to that. So when we talk about that this desire for us to have a culture that is really and truly safe and that is discipleship focused and open to all generations, that's going to take us holding each other accountable. It's going to take us, I think, going by the accountability structure that the New Testament teaches and, and kind of respecting each other in that regard and respecting each other's callings and giftings and all of that, and it's going to take living by the Holy Spirit instead of by our flesh, for instance. It's, it's going to take us really centering ourselves around the teachings of Jesus, but it's possible. And again, it's going to take that holding each other accountable to get there. So let's finish there then. And we've been talking about how this word, this idea, accountability, it's part of Christianity. It's, it's an integral part of our faith because at its most basic, to be a Christian is to be a follower of Jesus. But we've been talking about how that's a good thing. At the level of community, it needs to be there. Accountability needs to be there to prevent communities from going in a negative direction and instead going in a healthy one. And we've been talking about how how culture is a really powerful way of understanding this, how church communities create a culture. And to create a healthy one, we need to hold each other accountable to the vision that we sense that we're called to. So my hope is that we might, through this, start to embrace accountability. This week we've been talking about it at the level of community. Next week we're going to talk about it at more of the personal level and especially the need for there to be authentic and, and real relationships in place so this doesn't get abused, so that it's healthy all around. But my hope is that from this, we're starting to see the need to embrace this, the need to embrace accountability and to live it out. And I want to leave off with this verse because I think this really captures what we're talking about here. Paul says to all of us, I believe, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. All right, let's finish there and let's finish our service with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this time. We thank you for what we're learning here. And we just I want to, your help, I think, 
to, to view accountability as something that's healthy, that's something that's needed. And maybe that's going to take healing for some of us where we've been burned before, where we've seen this get abused. So help us to heal where we need to, to heal, to, to open our hearts up to trusting others again, to ho- opening up our hearts to letting others speak into our lives again. Because it can be really a powerful thing when it's done well and when it's done with the backbone of trust. And help us to be a community that really is holding ourselves accountable, first and foremost, to you, Jesus, to you, God, and and where we have the right kind of accountability structure in place. And so that we could really become a healthy culture, a culture that is truly safe, and a culture that really is living out your mission, Jesus, your mission to make disciples who make disciples so that we could be part of just bringing your kingdom into Brockville and into this world. So we just pray for your help in this, Jesus, helping us to embrace the kind of accountability that you teach, Lord Jesus, and not coming up with our own, that's for sure. So we give this to you, Jesus, and and Holy Spirit, just continue to invite you to move in our community in this week and the coming weeks to change us and transform us. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if there's anything that you have a question about or a comment on, as I always say, feel free to contact us. We don't want you to feel alone in this just because you're watching online. So you can always email us again at info at the peer.church, or if you have a particular question about today's message, you can email me at jason at the peer.church. All right, well, otherwise, have a great week, and we'll see you next time. God bless. Bye.